Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, Our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. As we begin our worship today, uh, the Lord speaks to us first from Psalm chapter 16. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures, at your right hand. Let's worship together today. Generous God, giver of life, you know just what we need. Heard our prayer, you will provide. You know just what we need. I know who you are. I know who you are. Our God is the giver of life. Our God is the strength in the we could ever need you supply every time i lack i will remember you are the giver of life consistent god you never change you have all
taking the lie Our God is the giver of the lie Our God is the strength and the lie Everything that we could ever need you supply Every time I lack I will remember You are the giver Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. you 
So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. Well, here we are. We, we are coming to an end on, uh, on this series as we've been going through the book of Philippians. Again, we've entitled it Citizens. And if you've been in the book of Philippians and spent any time there, you know this isn't exactly one of those themes that just pops off the page uh, at you, this idea of citizens. But I think it's been really timely for us, um, for us to, to think about what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Uh, again, as Paul writes this, this letter back to, uh, to a people who live in a city, a very political city that has a high fervor for their, for their political excellence and their nationality. And just, they felt very confident in who they were as Romans, again, as a Roman colony. And you can about imagine the tension that the church felt trying to live between this idea that they are, that they're Roman, but yet they're also citizens of the kingdom of heaven and what does that mean for living and one of the things that we where we began one of the things we saw is that we're citizens of heaven who live as foreigners here in this world for the purpose of being ambassadors for jesus christ that he has a message of reconciliation that god has that message and it's our job to be an ambassador of that message so again, here's just a few things that we've covered over these last eight to 10 weeks when thinking about what does it mean to, to live out our citizenship, that we are citizens who can't lose, that we are uh, citizens of, of witness, We're citizens that are shaped by the cross. We shine, that we are citizens of sacrifice, that we are citizens that press on. We're citizens of, of peace. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about citizens of generosity. And so what we're going to do is, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4. So here again, we are in the last, uh, the last chapter. We're going to read verses 10 through 20 today. And there's only 23 verses in the entire uh, chapter 4. So we're right here at the, at the very end and really winding down. And so here's what I want, to, I want us to think about is this idea of we are citizens of generosity. So again, as Paul is writing this thank you letter to the gift, for the gift that had been given to him, he ends with this, this beautiful section of what it means to both give and to receive. And so there's just some beautiful things in here. So we're going to take a look at this, verses 10 through 20. Uh, of course, it'll be up on the screen. But if you have a Bible in front of you, it might, uh, might be nice to open it up and, and read with as well. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it means to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphrodites the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing 
to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So a couple things I just want to point out. One is, is this, we're going to talk about money. Specifically, even within money, being financially generous. Now, if you've been around a church or if you've listened to other pastors, this is a topic that kind of makes people squirm from time to time. It's not exactly one that uh, pastors enjoy addressing, nor do people enjoy it when the pastor does address uh, this issue. I think it stems from the fact that there are, there are those out there, whether they're online or they're on TV or they're on the radio, there are some pastors that have used the idea of financial generosity in a manipulative sort of a way where they will, they will call you to be financially generous and then say, give me money, give me money. And so what's happened is that there's a swell of this years ago in the, in the church where churches kind of backed away from talking about money because we, we didn't want to be seen in that light, that we're being manipulative or that we're asking for a bunch of money and wanting people to give to us. So as a result, the church has backed off the conversation and, and really haven't addressed it on a regular basis because that stigma is there. I was thinking about this. There's an unintended consequence that's come as a result of that. There are so many, I would say if just 40 or so and younger, that don't have a good teaching and a good understanding of what God calls us to with our money. A lot of that is, again, the church doesn't want to talk about it, so they don't. And if, and if it's not talked about in the home, some of the principles that Jesus laid out, some of the principles that God has given us in his word are not taught. And we don't know them. And so we have this whole generation that is, that is void of, of having a financial understanding of how God views their money, a biblical understanding of how God views the money. So we're going to talk about being financially generous. And we're going to because money is a big deal as a part of the citizenship. God cares how we handle the resources that he's entrusted to us. So here's what we're not going to talk about today. Okay, so I can make a couple promises to you. One promise that I'm going to make to you is I'm not going to ask for any money today. All right, so you're not going to get a Give Now link uh, showing up right now or anything like that. We're not, we're not going to be talking about the, the, the gift that I'm looking to get from you. And, and honestly, I'm not going to use this message as, as an opportunity to, uh, to spur on future giving like next week or the week after. This isn't like a setup for a, fu- a future ask. I'm sorry, with, with one little caveat. We are approaching the end of the fiscal year or the end of the calendar year. So we are going to talk a little bit about giving, but I promise those were not tied together intentionally. But we're going to talk today about being financially generous and what that looks like. So there's a, there's a commentary, Exalting Jesus in Philippians, that uh, Tony Meridia wrote. Um, and uh, as, he, as he put that commentary together, there were six words that he had come up with in this text. And I thought this was as, as beautiful uh, of an outline as there was for these verses. And so rather than trying to reinvent it, I'm just going to steal his, and we're going to talk through this a little bit. So there are six of these words. So the challenge we have is that I'm only going to talk about two of them today. So rather than going just an inch deep on all six, what I'm going to encourage you to do is take some time on your own and and look up and and process the other four as we spend time on the two. So here are the six. The first one is the word gratitude. It shows up in in the concept of verse 10. Paul rejoices at this gift, at the fact that these, these, these Philippians, this Philippian church, gives him a gift. He's rejoicing in that gift. He's grateful for it. But it's also interesting how he's grateful in the Lord for the gift. He's not just thankful, thank you for giving me the gift. It's thank God for this gift. So he's grateful for the gift. So the first word is gratitude. Second word is contentment. We'll look at that. The third word is partnership. And it shows up in verses 14 to 16 of our, of our text today. And it really gets to this idea of of those that are involved in the church and engaged in the church as to whether or not they are partners or whether they are consumers. See, a partner is invested in the mission of the organization, the mission of the church. A consumer is there to receive goods only, 
to receive from them but never partner with. Paul talked about this when he was in Thessalonica. None of the other churches, including the Thessalonican church, when Paul was in need, no one provided, no one helped. So they're receiving the teachings from Paul. They're receiving the pastoral care from Paul, but they aren't partnering with him. But the Philippian church did, so he calls them out for their partnership. But we're not going to talk about that one either. The, uh, the uh, fourth word is fruitfulness. We're going to talk about that one. But the fifth word is, uh, is worship, and that shows up in verse 18. That this, uh, this gift is a fragrant offering to the Lord. That he loves this gratitude or this, this generosity that comes and this financial generosity that, that God sees it as a fragrant offering. But it's also interesting because what Paul does is he, he connects this gift that was a tangible gift given to Paul, but Paul says that was actually an offering to God. So he sees that even as the generosity is being uh, uh, demonstrated in tangible ways to those around him and around the church, they're actually an offering given to God himself. But we're not going to talk about that either. And the sixth one that we're not going to talk about is we're not going to talk about faith and what that looks like in, in giving and receiving, which shows up in verses 19 and 20, how we have an opportunity to grow in our faith as a result of our generosity. As we live financially generous, we see how God will provide for our needs, that God will provide what we need. And his provision, yes, can be tangible. It can be financial. He's not talking about a return on investment, right? So if I put $100 into the church, that I'm going to somehow get 110 back from God with some sort of return on my investment. But he's going to provide for my needs even as I'm being financially generous. And as he does that, it may be financial and maybe tangible needs, but it's also these other blessings that God gives, which results in this outpouring of praise in verse 20. That financial generosity gives us opportunities to grow in our faith. Those are the four that we're not going to talk about. So here's what I want to do. I want to double back and I want to look at the two things, those two specific areas in which we can talk about and kind of dive into. And I think they're the ones that help us understand uh, this in, in, a, in a powerful way, this idea of financial generosity and where it comes from and why do we do it. And the first one really deals with a roadblock that we feel in our ability to be financially generous. So in verses 11 through uh, 13, Paul goes into this little, this little side call or side, side statements on the idea of contentment. And, and, he, and he really lays this out. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul uses a word uh, the, for the word content. There's a Greek word that's used that, that has, a, has a deep meaning behind contentment. The Stoics uh, of, the, of the age would use this word to, to help describe what it means to be detached from the human and outward circumstances and find some sort of an inward self-sufficiency. So the concept here was that whatever's happening around you didn't matter because I'm self-sufficient in myself. This showed up by the fact that their, their really joyful moments were not all that high. They were fairly uh, mellow in that. In those deep sorrow moments, they were fairly mellow in that as well. They were stoic in their expressions and stoic in their life. Because it was all about separating yourself and being sufficient with yourself. It's a self-sufficiency. That's the word that Paul uses when he talks about content. But he spins it a little bit because his sufficiency is not in self. It's a Christ sufficiency. See, his whole thing, if I'm going to be content, it's not because I'm content with myself and who I am and what's inside of me. But I am content because of Christ. That Jesus is enough for me. So our citizenship of contentment, the citizenship that calls us to a life of contentment, is one that is rooted in Jesus Christ. And once we realize that it's not about myself or our circumstances, that it's about Jesus, 
we can begin to see a contentment that isn't connected to our circumstances. It's disconnected from that world, whether it's high or whether it's low. Paul talks about this in the idea of whether he has plenty or whether he is in need. He contrasts both of them. And Paul would understand and know both of them. He, he had enough situations that we can read about through the book of Acts as well as through his letters that he lived in, in certain circumstances where he would have been around people who had plenty. Probably some lavish meals involved and just ex- excessive uh, lifestyle in, in areas that he would have been around. He understands having plenty and not going hungry. He also was very familiar with the other side, which, which was the need. I mean, he knew what it meant to be hungry and to be thirsty and to be naked and to be cold. And he knew that world and, and he knew it well. But what's interesting is to see that Paul, in, in, in either of those circumstances, his contentment didn't change. He was content whether he had plenty or whether he had very little. Why? Because his contentment wasn't based on what he had at that moment. His contentment was connected to Jesus, that he is enough. Here's the reality. We often think that we'll be content if we had just a little bit more. Anybody else feel that way? Do you feel that way? I, I do. I feel like, man, if I, I, I'm almost there. I have so much. Thank you, Lord. I have so many blessings. I just need a little bit more. And a little bit more. Well, the problem is, and, and, and you can feel this because I'm sure you've said this before and received that little bit more, but then a the little bit more uh, went out a little further, is that the gap, the gap between more and enough, it never closes. So if your contentment is locked up in having enough, then you'll never be content because you're always gonna need just a little bit more to check the box that says, now I have enough. So Paul, in his plenty, understood that it wasn't about that, or even in his need, that if I had just a little bit more God, now I would be content. But there's also a side of us that maybe some of us feel that we have so much that we're discontent with all that we had, and I'd be more holy, I'd be more content if I just had less. That I'm already so blessed, and maybe that, that's too much for me, and, and that's where my discontentment is sitting, is because I, I need to get rid of some things, or I need to, I need to cleanse my life and, and sell all I have and give it to the poor, or however we're going to live out our life to say we need less stuff. But what Paul's saying is even in his plenty, he was content. Because his contentment didn't rest in his circumstances or in what he had. His contentment was in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Do you find that this is hard, this idea of contentment? I find it very hard. I find living content in this world to be very difficult. And there's a reason why. It's because our country, our Western way of civilization, it's all about discontent. Like everything in this country is built to make us discontent. Let me give you a couple examples. One would be like in marketing, all right? So first of all, we are bombarded by hundreds, thousands of marketing messages per day. Those marketing messages have to bring us to the point where we are no longer content with what we have. Because here's the problem. If you and I are content with the possessions that we have, if you and I are content with the way we spend and uh, spend our vacation time, if we're content with the way we live, we're not buying things. We're not spending money. And if we're not spending money, they ain't making any money, right? So they have to make us discontent. Marketing is designed to say that what you have isn't quite good enough. What you have isn't quite new enough. It isn't quite big enough. It isn't quite nice enough. The marketing drives us to the point where we are discontent and we need to buy something more so that they can make their money. So our marketing system makes us discontent in this world. Frankly, so does our news networking system. 
Just think about this for a minute. Your favorite cable news network, your favorite online news system, your favorite news radio station, they say they are there to keep you informed. But the reality is they exist to make money. These news sources, your cable news network, your social media feeds, your online systems, your, your radio stations, they aren't designed and they don't exist just to keep you informed. They exist to make money. How are they going to make money off of you? They sell you information. So they're going to sell you information. But if you are content and you are happy and you are feeling good about the direction of our country and, and the other political parties and all these types of things, if you're content in that, you're probably not consuming more of their information. But if they can get you just to that edge of, of angry and scared where those two come together, then you're locked into them and you need to continue to consume their information because they're helping you understand and helping you in your fear. They're, they're helping you in your anger by giving you more anger and more things to be concerned about. But they exist for the purpose of selling you because when you are consuming their information, they make ad revenue. If you aren't watching, if you aren't listening, if you aren't clicking, they don't make the money. So whether it be your social media or your cable news network or your, your online news source or your radio station, they exist to make money off of you. And they do that by keeping you discontent. So between marketing and between news and between all these other influences in our life, if we're happy and content, they aren't making money. We live in a world that bombards us to say, don't be content. So what hope is there? It's interesting to watch Paul because there's a hope in the way that Paul talks about his contentment. See, Paul talks about his contentment as being learned. He learned his contentment in verse 12. Now, I don't know how you view Paul. I don't know how you see that, that his uh, spiritual growth happened. There's oftentimes, I think, that when he got struck by the light and knocked off his high horse on the way to Damascus, that somehow God just poof, magically implanted so much of this into him. But the reality is that Paul learned so much of what we see in him today. So much of what we read from his letters, he learned as he spent time in the Word, as he spent time with others. And the contentment was no difference. He said, I have learned the secret of being content. How did he learn that secret? He learned it by those first two things we talked about. Understanding that his contentment is in Christ alone and his contentment is not tied up in what he has or what the world is happening or what's happening in the world. So whether he had plenty, if he was living in a season of plenty, he was content because he was focused on Jesus Christ. When he was in need, he was content because he was focused on Jesus Christ. It's his continual focus on Jesus Christ over and over again. And, and listen, I don't know Paul, I didn't meet Paul, but I'm willing to bet that there are moments in Paul's life where when he was in need, he probably didn't feel the most content. But over time, as he trusted in God and God provided, God showed up, God met his needs, he began to grow in trusting in Jesus Christ and focusing on him. Contentment grew as he shifted his eyes from the circumstances and everything around him to Jesus Christ. Contentment is learned. So I have a question for you. It's a question that I read as I was doing some of my prep, and it's a question, frankly, that I don't like. Uh, it made me feel uncomfortable, and I didn't want to have to answer it. So since I read it and I felt uncomfortable about it, I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable about it too. So here's the question. Do you think that a lack of contentment has made you less flexible to live on mission? Do you think that, that there's a lack of contentment in your life that has made it difficult for you because you're not as flexible, because your lack of contentment has, has made you financially uh, exhausted because you have so much? 
or the lack of contentment is you can't make a move because you have needs and those needs be, need to be met before you can make a move. Has a lack of contentment made you less flexible to live on mission? And I know it has for me. Paul talks about financial generosity. He talks about contentment. He also talks about fruitfulness. This is the, other, the last one I want to I just talk about in that list of six. I have an apple tree uh, in my yard, and uh, this year it produced exactly zero apples. Uh, don't, don't worry, next year it will produce seven billion. <laughs> I don't know why it does this. It's, we got to have a conversation with that tree because it's every other year it's either plenty or in need. Right? Maybe that's what I'm supposed to learn in this. I don't know. But the point is this, this apple tree produces apples. Why does the apple tree produce apples on the years that it does? It's because in its DNA, at its core, it is an apple tree. It produces the apples because that's what it is. The fruit just comes out of what is inside of that tree. We, we planted a mountain ash, just this beautiful decorative tree back by our patio in the backyard. Next year, as spring comes, there will be exactly zero orange blossoms on that tree. It will not produce oranges. Why? Because it isn't an orange tree. It is a mountain ash. That's what it is. Fruit comes out from what is inside. So that's an important understanding because fruit is a way in which we are described as Christians Uh, throughout the New Testament, that because a transformation has occurred within us, fruit comes out of us. All right, so why do I talk about that? I talk about that because of verse 17. So uh, verse 17 in, in uh, in the NIV never mentions the word fruit. It's not there anywhere. However, if you look at the Greek, in the Greek, the word karpon shows up. Well, karpon is the Greek word for fruit. So as much as I love the NIV translation, the New International Version, which is my base translation, it's, it's, what, I, it's what I read here. It's what I have with me since I was a kid. I've, I've gone through the NIV. I love the NIV. There's a nuance that they miss in this particular verse. So I love what the ESV says. I love how the ESV translates this. They say that, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. The ESV pulls that word fruit out. Now, I understand what the NIV was doing. I did some research into it. I get why they did what they did. I just think there's a nuance that is missing. Because what is showing up here is that generosity and financial generosity is what comes out of a heart that has been transformed. So as a result, Paul is not seeking another gift. So as he says thank you, and as he's talking about financial generosity, he's not trying to use it to say, oh, thank you for your gift, just give me more. He says, not that I seek the gift, I seek the fruit. And why is that such a big deal? It's a big deal because the fruit is the sign of what is inside. The same way I could walk out when I first moved into my house and I wasn't sure what kind of tree that was, but by springtime and I saw little apples on it, I had a pretty good indication that that was an apple tree because the fruit told me what it was on the inside. When Paul looks and sees the generosity of this church, he sees, I see the fruit of something that's been changed inside of you. And he seeks that fruit. One of the fruit that comes for a heart that has been transformed by the life and message of Jesus is financial generosity. It's financial generosity that 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 is an outpouring of a heart that's been transformed is to want to and have a desire to and to seek after giving and partnering with the work that God is doing in, in a church, in a community, and around the world. It's an outpouring of an inward heart change. So Paul says, I seek that fruit. And he seeks the fruit. He seeks the fruit that has an eternal uh, impact. He says, I want it to be credited to your account. 
that credited to your account has this, this idea of storing up for yourself treasures in heaven that Jesus talked about in, in Matthew chapter 6. It's that there's a gift that is given that, that has an immediate impact and it changes things and it, has, it affects people now. But there's also something that goes way beyond that God uses for eternal impact. So he says, I want this fruit, not another gift. I want this fruit because it shows that you are financially, the financial generosity shows that you've been a, had a heart that's been transformed. And that financial generosity that you have, man, it is credited to your account. Paul wants all of his churches to just stack up the credit on that side of the heavenly ledger book because they are so generous with, because of a heart that's been transformed. One of the desires I have as a pastor is to have so much money given to the church that we have to figure out what we're going to do with it. Now, I know how that sounds, but if I apply verse 17 to that statement, it's not because we want the money at the church. It's because what that means for those that are giving that money. When money is given, when financial generosity comes, it's because there has been a heart that has been impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when there's an outpouring of financial generosity, that means there's an outpouring of Holy Spirit work in the lives of people. That's what we desire. We desire to see what God is doing. And then we get to see the fruit of that in financial generosity. So one question that has to do with this, is financial generosity, is that a fruit that is bore because of your transformed heart? If your heart has been transformed by that life and message of Jesus, by the gospel of Jesus, is financial generosity part of the fruit that comes out a desire to partner and to care and to love those that are around you and see what God is doing and be a part of the kingdom work that's happening. It's just such an interesting and a beautiful way for Paul to end this letter. I love the gift. There's a gift given in a financial way to meet the immediate needs of Paul in prison. And as a result, we have this letter today. The, the lasting impact of that gift is also we have a letter today in which Paul talks about how he received the gift as well as how the gift was given and how it all works together. And Paul does this beautiful job to talk about an issue we don't talk about much in the church today. Maybe we need to talk about it more. Not that we desire the gift, but that we seek the fruit. So my prayer for you is that as you see and feel and experience the heart transformational work that the Holy Spirit does inside of each one of us. That fruit comes. And part of that fruit is a financial generosity to the work that God is doing in this community and around the world for the impact of his kingdom. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father God, so this is one of those issues, God, that oof, money you know how big of a deal it was, Jesus, because you, you taught on it so much. The rich young ruler who, who shows up at your feet and then walks away just absolutely heartbroken because you tell him to sell what he has and give it to the poor. Not that he shouldn't have the wealth, but God, you saw that he was idolizing that wealth. So even as you looked at that guy, like, Lord, money is such a hard area for us because we love it. And we know that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So Lord, it shouldn't surprise us that when our hearts are transformed, that financial generosity and the giving away of money would be a fruit that would come as a result of transformed hearts. Lord, teach us to be content with what we have and what you've given. And Lord, may we live, live out the life that you've changed inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ is exalted to the highest place. He defeated death See the empty grave Rejoice
Thanks for worshiping with us today as you head back into the rest of your week and whatever lies in front of you for this day. Would you receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen and amen. Thanks for worshiping today. Thank you for tuning in. We would love to help you get connected to Further to Triumph. There's a couple ways that you can do that. We would love to pray for you. Yes. Prayer is a critical part of our church and our staff gathers every week to pray for, for all of the, the requests that we receive. Uh, you can head over to triumphlbc.org slash prayer to let us know how we can pray for you. Maybe you are looking for an in-person worship service and we would love to invite you to our services at our campuses. Over at our West Campus in West Fargo, we have services at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings and again at 6 p.m. on Wednesday nights. And at our East Campus in Moorhead, we have Sunday services at 9 and 10.30 and then Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Join us next week online or in person as we begin our new Advent series.